All right, friends, let's begin here with this first question. Speaking of Rabbi Steinzeltz, I think this is an appropriate first question. Question number one. Dear Rabbi, uh, we cry with you on the passing of your mentor, Rabbi Steinzeltz. We know that this is a loss, not just for you, but for the entire world. If you had to impart upon us some of the lessons he has taught you over the years, which lessons would you choose? So, I, I really have to organize my uh, many thoughts that have been streaming overflowingly ever since his passing on Friday. And I don't know if I can pick one lesson over another. There's really thousands of them. Um, so I'll just mention a few that come to mind. But I want to relate to the first part of the question that um, it is indeed a loss for the entire world. I think the world is now awakening and opening its eyes to the greatness of this man. It's unfortunate that sometimes people have to die in order for us to truly appreciate them. But that's the way human nature is. Um, so it's a loss for the entire world. The only word I will correct in your opening sentence is that we cry with you on the passing of your mentor. And it's no doubt the passing of not just my mentor, I think of our mentor and of uh, so many thousands of people's mentors. Um, but yet we cry together. So some of the lessons that he imparted upon me that I learned from Rabbi Steinsaltz, I would condense them maybe into three or four lessons. Let's see what comes up. Lesson number one, I would say, we spoke about this, is his selflessness. Uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz had no ego whatsoever. He was as humble as it gets. Um, uh, he would hate accolades and the, you know, those glorious introductions. You run away from honor as much as possible. Uh, and he was as selfless as could be. Why? Because he understood from a very young age that life is not about you. Life is about what is wanted of you, what is needed of you. It's not about what you want. It's about what life wants from you, so to speak, what God himself wants from you. And he, from a very young age, dedicated himself to that which God wanted from him. Now, I will tell you this. This was a man who life didn't come easy for him. He was replete with diseases. He had the Gaucher disease. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a very annoying disease and one that uh, for him, depends on the patient, but for him, uh, required him to go to the hospital once a month to hook himself up to a machine and have uh, received dialysis. Uh, once a month, imagine. It's a man that almost died on the surgery table twice. It's a man that um, had a son who was diagnosed with fatal leukemia and thanks to the blessings of the Baba Tereba was saved. It's a main man that uh, went as any trailblazer in any field, faced tremendous opposition, people burning his books and trying to excommunicate him. It's a man that had an uphill battle uh, on almost every, every endeavor that he did, his schools, his uh, work in Russia and uh, many of his books. But he never, never was phased by any of this because he understood that he's dedicated to life and to what God wants from him, not to what he wants, to his personal needs. That's why he never took any vacation. That's why he uh, worked crazy hours, superhuman hours. Uh, I mean, maybe he slept three hours a night, not even. Uh, that's why he... Um, was uh, relatable to each and every one because they understood, like we spoke about today, that everyone that was in front of him was placed there for, because God wanted him to interact with them. So it was always about the other. That's, that, I would say, is really number one. Number two, another thing that comes to mind, Robert Stanz was a man who saw the big picture, never got stuck with the trivialities of life. You know, he once told me, I've mentioned this many times, but he once called me aside and he asked me, Penny, do you know what the difference is between a wise man and a fool? And he, he responded. He said, I'll tell you what it is. A fool makes the trivial important and the important trivial. A wise man makes the important important and the trivial trivial. Rabbi Steinsatz embodied that. He saw the big picture. He made the important important. And he saw the big picture not just as it is today, but as it is in the future. I think his work reflects that. He wrote uh, this translation, this commentary on the Jewish canon of uh, the, the canon of the Jewish library because he wanted to speak about, uh, you know, to do what will be good, not just for the now, but for 
all generations to come. He will be inscribed in the books of history as the Rashi of his generation that walked for the future like very few in history did. You know, I asked him once, why don't you write about the news? You know, in Israel, the terrorist attacks and the peace process and uh, so-called peace process and so on. And he said, I'm not a person who plants cucumbers. I'm a person who plants avocado trees that stay on for years and years and years. Cucumbers, you enjoy them, they grow quickly, you enjoy them, and then the plant dies and you have to try and revive it. When you plant an avocado tree, it's, it's there forever and ever. Um, that's what he did. He didn't look at the now and what's, what's simp you know, what seems to be so important right now, but really is not. And he never got caught by that. He was never bothered by the trivialities of life. Uh, even the people who opposed him the most, so what, that's a trivial thing. My most important thing is, is my work and to, bring, to make the Torah accessible to all, to bring people closer to their Judaism. And everything else was trivial in his eyes. So that's number two. Um, number three, I would say it's his unbelievable, unconditional love to each and all. He could be very harsh with people, but that didn't take away from the tremendous devotion he had to everyone. He would just ask for his help. Even before they asked for help, he was already there helping them. I know that firsthand. I mean, he's a person who helped me many times and I very often ask myself, why, why is he spending so much time on me? This is a man that speaks to presidents and prime ministers that is honored by universities across the world from Yale to Oxford. This is a man who deals with monumental works why deal with a picture like me? Why deal with other students like, like me or with just a stranger in the street? That's because he loved. He loved you unconditionally, not for who you can become, not for the titles that you had, but for the soul that you are. That's what he saw. And he saw that in everyone. I tell the story. It's again, I'm going to repeat myself, but a story I've told many times just to maybe convey the love that he had. And that is that I was once walking with him on Times, in Times Square in Manhattan, New York. And as you may know, in Manhattan, New York, and in Times Square in particular, the people that give us flyers, some of them very inappropriate. Robert Stauss is there walking with me and he takes every flyer that is given to him. And some flyers, I don't have to tell you, are you know, half naked women to very inappropriate places. And I asked him, why, why are you collecting all these flyers? You don't need them. And he said, you're right, I don't need them, but they need me to take them. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, they probably get their pay only after they distribute all these flies that they are given. So when I take it, I help this person get his pay a little bit quicker. So why not help a stranger get his pay a little quicker? Why not do someone else a favor? And this was the incredible out of the box type of love that he had for even strangers in the street, someone who was giving out the most inappropriate flyers, yet he loved him and he wanted to help him get his pay a little quicker. Uh, and I saw that love so many times through his tears. The person that when he spoke about the pain of others, he would cry almost each and every time. I've seen him cry about people that were in the hospital and I've seen him cry about uh, children who were having a tough time with uh, being bullied, and I was, uh, saw him cry with parents who were having a tough time with their rebellious children. Uh, each time he spoke about them, it made him cry. Now, this was a man who was the biggest intellect. Usually intellectual people are cold and dry. But he had the heart of, uh, that could fill up rooms and rooms and rooms. And that's, again, because of the unconditional love that he had for everyone. And I think, by the way, this is exactly why we're seeing so many people write about Rabbi Steinzeltz. Uh, from across the entire spectrum of humanity. That's because when you love someone so strongly, so intensely, so unconditionally, then they re usually respond with love and you make an impact forever. And that's really what Rabbi Stanz did. He may have met people just for a few minutes during the whole lifetime, just once. And they made an impact thanks to that unconditional intense love that he had for all. Number three, Go on and on. Um, maybe one last idea that comes to mind, then we'll go on to the next question, but I think it was his incessant drive. Uh, the man 
was as driven as could be. I once asked him, Rabbi Steinsaltz, do you consider yourself happy? And he responded, I don't know if I'm happy, but I'm driven. Now, uh, I think he was answering the question that if you're driven, you don't have time to preoccupy yourself with all your troubles. So that gives birth to a little more room for, for joy and for happiness. I think uh, sadness comes from the self-preoccupation. Oi, 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 my life is so terrible. When you're driven towards a purpose that's greater than you, you don't really have time to, to preoccupy yourself with yourself. So, so automatically you, you're happier. So I think he was giving me an answer then, but he also defined who he was. He was as driven as could be. And that drive led him to take upon himself things that he himself didn't believe he could take upon himself. Uh, you know, the famous story with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe telling him that you have three things on your plate, you're asking me what you should take off. Don't take off anything, add another thing. Now, uh, Rabbi Shans thought it was impossible, but he did it because he was so loyal to the Rebbe and, and he did it. And then he realized, yes, my drive can lead me to do anything. So, and I think there's a lot to learn from that. I, you know, he once said about the Lubavitch Rebbe to a large group of, of Hasidim that the Rebbe doesn't sleep not because he's superhuman. The Rebbe doesn't sleep because you, Hasidim, you, his disciples are sleeping. You're not moving. You're supposed to be awake. Wake up. Change the world. That's what the Rebbe wants you to do. But you're not doing that. Instead, you're sleeping. So the Rebbe has to not sleep to do your work really what he said, harsh words. But in a way, I think he was also speaking about himself. He didn't sleep because we are sleeping. And if we can just uh, uh, learn from him just, uh, and take upon ourselves just a little bit, a fraction of his drive, I think things could be different, not just for ourselves, but for our world. So that is yet another lesson I take from our standouts. And again, I can go on and on and on and on uh, with many, many anecdotes. But he really wanted to change the world, change people. He had this drive that led him to achieve the impossible. He therefore related to every moment with that intense drive. Uh, you know, when you met him, it was like getting in touch with electricity. And that electricity changed you. It left a mark on you, no doubt. That's why, again, you could have met someone for one minute, but when you meet electricity for one minute, you, you're electrified. Even for a few seconds, you're electrified. When you met Rabbi Stans, for a few seconds, you electrified. Why? Because he had that intensity about him of wanting to change the world with that unconditional love, and that changed you. I can tell you that uh, one of the beautiful anecdotes that came out this week that a friend of mine uh, told me that he, not long ago, asked Rabbi Stans for a blessing on his birthday. And Rabbi Stans gave him a very creative, very powerful blessing. You don't just say, oh, you should have a long life and you should be successful. That wasn't Rabbi Stanis's language, too banal for him. Uh, what he said to him is that I give you the blessing that next year on your birthday, you will be so positively transformed that you won't recognize yourself. That's the blessing he gave him. And that's electricity. And that's that drive. And that's that love. And that changes you. Anyhow, so that's just a few things about Rabbi Stanis to start off our Q&A with, with uh, this giant of mankind. Um, all right, let's go on to the next questions we have here. So um, question, this question is, Rabbi, what does our history say about drugs, marijuana, Etc. Etc. Is it true that some Torah students get high to understand the Torah better or to get closer to Hashem? So I don't know where you got that from. I, I don't think that's true. Um, now, beyond the health issues that uh, drugs present, even marijuana uh, and even uh, you know lighter drugs. Uh, but I, I'll tell you what Rav Stein said, speaking of Rav Steinsel. And someone asked him, really, what do you think about smoking marijuana? And he said just that. He said, beyond the health issues, the big question is, who is in control of who? Are you in control of the drugs or are the drugs in control of you? 
Unfortunately, with drugs, they get in control of you. And that should never be a way of life. You should always be in control of yourself, control of your being, in control of your psyche, in control of your deeper self. With drugs, drugs take control completely. And that's the deepest issue. So that's the answer to that question with Robert Stanis's words. Next question, I think we're related to that in the lunch alone, but it's still a question for tomorrow night. It says in the title, so for tonight, what makes a rabbi a Chabad rabbi? Um, and that's, that we related to, I think a Chabad rabbi, first and foremost, is someone who's devoted to the Lubavitch Rebbe. Number two, and to his teachings, and to his uh, Walter Chong, so to speak. Number two, I think it's someone <clears throat> who uh, adheres to the Chabad philosophy uh, that has many elements to it. One element is an element we just spoke of, that your mind should always be in control of your heart. Another element is the element of uh, tremendous contemplation on God and, um, and, and connecting not just with your heart, but with your mind to God. Another element is seeing God everywhere. That God is in every aspect of life, in every item of life. Uh, it's not that God is relegated just to the synagogue or to the holy days of the year, but God is really everywhere. And there are many other elements to the Chabad philosophy. That's number two. Number three, it could be the Chabad customs, the garbs that they wear, um, the prayer, you know, the Nusach, the, the prayer version that they have. Uh, they pray according to the version of the Ari, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. Uh, number four, I think it's also maybe your education and uh, the Chabad schools you went to and that shapes you as a Chabad rabbi, no doubt. So that is uh, maybe what, how you define a Chabad rabbi. Uh, certainly, I think what uh, you find among all Chabad rabbis is speaking of unconditional love, is that unconditional love, their ability to go to Timbuktu and Alaska and to Beijing, China and... Uh, Sydney, Australia, and uh, Buenos Mar del Plata, Argentina, where my sister is with her husband doing wonderful work. And uh, um, Greenland, uh, where I have a dear friend, uh, their ability to go to all these places and devote themselves just to love and to bring the beauty of Judaism to all of the surroundings is certainly what unites all Chabad rabbis and what makes them also special. Chabad rabbi. So that's, that maybe is another, another uh, element. Okay. Um, next question. So, uh, last night, uh, I won't say the name because I try to keep these questions in confident, uh, confidential, but last night someone hosted a Zoom meeting about Jewish death and burial versus cremation. The speaker said that the souls suffer when a person is cremated. I always thought that that would be my plan. What does one do if you don't have a burial plot anywhere or immediate families and immediate family is not observant, nor do they live close by, and the relatives that are observant are scattered. And the speaker also mentioned that cremation is a growing trend among the Jewish population. So um, I don't know if the speaker explained why we're so against uh, cremation. I wasn't there and I'm sure she did. Uh, but it's true that Judaism is against cremation um, in, the, in the strongest terms. Can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, we can hear you. I'm getting signals that my internet is slow. No, you're doing great. Okay, good. And my it's battery, delayed. It's delayed? Yes. But you can By the way, can I just say something? Talk. My friend from Chicago just joined. Nira, hi. Oh, uh, hi, my Nira. Friend, Nira Wolf, she's Israeli. You have to be careful with the Hebrew. Nira, kol akavod. Kol akavod, Nira. Okay, thank you for joining us. All right, so um, it's true that Judaism is against cremation very much so. Uh, and not only that, I'll add that it's true that the soul suffers when it sees its body uh, being cremated. The reason for that is because the body becomes holy through the marriage that it has with the soul. 
you see, when the soul is sent down to this world, it's put in the body. And the body and the soul learn to live each other almost like spouses. They are married. They're opposites. But they work with each other. The soul can't do mitzvahs without a body. The body also helps the soul be nourished. So they help each other. Uh, stay healthy. And um, when the body and the soul are separated by death, then the soul still remains connected to its body very much. And when it sees its body being burned, it might not be a part of it anymore, but it was its spouse for a very long time. And it's a part of him, it has become a part of him. It was sanctified through it. So the soul suffers from that sight very much, deeply. And that's really the mystical reason of why we're so against cremation. Beyond the fact that maybe on a more simplistic level, our body is not ours. That's why we're also against tattoos. The God gave us a body. It's not ours. And just like I can't take something that's not mine and do whatever I want with it, burn it, or even make a scratch on it, it's just not mine. So too, I can't just uh, do whatever I want with the body and I have to let it be and return it to God just the way I received it and developed in me by God. So that's yet another reason. Now, what do you do if you don't have a burial plot anywhere? We spoke about this interestingly actually last week. And that is that, by the way, it's a good omen, so to speak. It's good fortune to buy a burial plot for yourself during your lifetime. It's a good omen for a long life. Your life and your years will be prolonged if you buy a burial plot. Now, where and when, that's, that's your decision. But uh, there's, there's, there's another element I want to add and maybe a third reason. And that is that when you do buy a burial plot and eventually after 120, you are buried in that burial plot. I think you're doing a tremendous service to all the people who loved you, not just your family members or your friends or your acquaintances. And the service you're doing is allowing them to come to a grave, to pray, to connect, because part of you again is there. The soul was, became a part of the body. It has some remnants of the soul in it. And therefore you're always somehow somewhat there in that grave. And you allow people really to find closure in the morning. You allow people to connect to you, to, to, to truly continue this, this relationship, this communication. And I, I, I think it's, it's the greatest therapy you can give to your loved ones once uh, you're gone after 120. So that's to relate to this question. All right, friends, really, that's, uh, those are the only questions I think I received this week. Unless you want to correct me, maybe you did send in a question, I don't think so. And you want to pose it now? Anyone? I, my battery is showing that it's low, and I'm not understanding why. Let me make sure my computer is connected. Any questions, feel free to ask your questions via chat or again uh, by unmuting yourself. Not sure why. I'm so sorry, my computer, I don't want my computer to die and then this class will end. And it shows that the battery is low and for some reason it's not charging. Let me see if I can fix this. Okay, fixed it. Thank God. All right, any questions? Friends, please uh, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask the question of your choice. I have a question. Yes, please, Sue, go for it. Did you say that you know a rabbi in Greenland? Uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, Is I know there he, a Jewish I, community there. There is, there is, in uh, what's the city, the main city they called? A weird name. Um, what is it called? Anyone know? I'll I know Reykjavik. Iceland, it's Reykjavik. But that's, that's right, Reykjavik. So oh, exactly. Iceland. Uh, sorry, so then in Iceland, I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. In Iceland, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, there is. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so the the rabbi's wife is uh, uh, his name. The rabbi is Rabbi Avram Feldman, but his wife is Mushka Namdar, who happens to be the first cousin of my brother-in-law. Uh, and I know her. I worked with her. She was a counselor by me. So it's a small world. Yeah. Oh, I was there 15 years ago. Oh. I didn't. They had a Jewish community, though. Very nice. <laughs> Okay. Right. Right. Anybody else? Anyone else? Question. Yes, I have a thought. Yes. When you were talking about Rabbi Steinsaltz and he was driven, you know, to, to do. Yeah. I don't know why I thought of children who in our society, I, I, you know, I've worked with, I love kids and, you know, some of them are driven. They, they, they just have to do, they're always doing. Yeah. And a lot of times that's not seen as a gift. And I wonder if that, you know, because I do see it a lot of times as a gift, not a problem, not a label. Right. And, 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 it's making me think about re, kind of reframing all that, that that it's because their mind is busy that they, that, you know, so connected to God that they do have a lot to do. And right. it would be good for a parent to guide them to do those things, even right. though there might be many things. Right, right. And, and look, I agree with you, Annie. I think that Unfortunately, we have labels for everything in our generation. I know. That sometimes we don't see the most simple phenomena that are right in front of our eyes. And a child that might seem so driven might be labeled as ADHD. Yeah, oh, yeah. Diagnosed as hi hyperactive or whatever it may be. And, and we miss the fact, the simple fact that he's very, very driven, which is unfortunate. Now, uh, sometimes he might also suffer from ADHD. The diagnosis might be right. But then it's the question of uh, channeling that ADHD to, to uh, the, the good area so that he can use it as a drive, right? Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't see that too often by educators. Now, um, uh, I, I think that uh, what, what a good educator does is not only does a good educator channel those hyperactivities uh, towards uh, something towards a passion and then turns it into a drive. But I think the good educator also knows the passion that this person will be seduced into, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he creates it for his student. And he understands his student so well that he says, you know what, here's something I think uh, will, you'll like. I, I, can, I can tell you this, again, speaking of Robert Townsend, like, like I said, I can go on for hours upon hours with the thousands of anecdotes and stories I've accumulated over the years and I was really privileged to, to amass. But um, I, I was a young teenager, 18, 18 years old. And my life dream was to go to the Israeli army. We lived in Israel, all my friends were going to the army. And I uh, have the, the Sephardic genetic disease. I think I mentioned this in the past. And when the, going to the army, they uh, when, when went through the test, they told me, sorry, you have FMF, familiar with the fever, for which means you have the profile of 21, means you can't go. I was broken. I, I, I was at a loss of words and loss of direction. And I went to see Rabbi Steinzeltz. Now, until that point, I really wanted to be a lawyer. And Rabbi Steinzeltz said, hey, there's an opening in the community in Geneva to go help out the community, especially with the youth activities. Why don't you go? Now, this was the most far-fetched idea you can think of. It was like completely out of the box. And being a devout student, I said, okay, if that's what you say, I'll do it. And I went and changed my life. And I, I started working with the community and something within me clicked. And I said, okay, maybe I don't want to be a lawyer. Maybe I want to be a rabbi. And it was Robert Stown says, genius. Uh, and education par excellence that provided this passion that I did not know yet was a passion for me, presented in front of me in the most personable way. And that drew me towards it and then created that drive. 
and that I think is is really the the art of of uh, the best of the best educators. Yeah.